I want you to turn with me, please, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Familiar passage of scripture. I'm going to look at a few verses from, from verse 4. John chapter 15. In the, the, both the morning class and the evening class in our uh, weekly studies, we're towards the end of John's gospel in the morning class and we're, we're in the book of Ephesians in the evening class at the present time. And we've discovered a remarkable crossover between uh, uh, similar messages in, in, in what we've been studying right at this moment in time. For example... We've been learning in John's Gospel, and, and please don't think that this is a teacher being pedantic in any way, shape or form, but we've been seeing in John's Gospel that John spells it out very clearly that we pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not wrong to say, dear Lord Jesus, but it's not what God taught us to say. He said, when you pray, say, our Father. Our Father. We, we, we don't need, and I say this very respectfully, we don't need to talk to our brother, we talk to our father. And you say, oh, come on, Chris, that's getting dangerous, getting dangerous. I know that there, are, there is one God. <laughs> in a doctrinal statement that Merle and I are very familiar with, we believe that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, undivided in essence and co-equal in power and glory. Believe that, absolutely believe that, though I don't understand it. The great sage said that if you try to understand the Holy Spirit, you'll blow your mind. If you deny it, you'll blow your faith. And, and there's a lot of truth in that. Try and de de understand the Trinity, you blow your mind. Try to deny it and you blow your faith. But clearly the, the scripture attests to that. But what we find is that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, as far as our walk with God is concerned, have functional input into our lives in different ways. So Christ, God become man and dwelling among us, is the Saviour who opens for us the way to God. A fountain has been opened in the house of David for sin and unrighteousness. He opened the way to God. Jesus himself said at the end of John chapter 1 that, that, that he was the one on whom the angels ascended and descended from heaven and that we are to ascend on him. He is the ladder, as it were, established on earth. When Jacob had a vision of a ladder, it wasn't a ladder that had been let down from heaven. It was a ladder that was established on earth, reaching to heaven. And that's Christ the one who was set up on earth that we might reach to God, that we might ascend to God. The Father is, is God Almighty, yes, and yes, Jesus is and so is the Holy Spirit, but in functional terms, God the Father sent his Son, the Lord Jesus, that you and I might be saved. And the Holy Spirit we learn in Scripture again and again and again, and Jesus himself taught it. It's a good thing that I go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't come, then you're going to miss out on so much because when he comes, he will teach you all about me and he will reveal me to you. He will not speak of himself, he'll speak of me. The Holy Spirit is the most self-effacing um, a member of the Godhead. He's not interested in praise to the Holy Spirit. He's interested in praise to the Father through the Son. Oh, that the people of God were that self-effacing. Wanting praise to the Father through the Son and not praise for ourselves. Neil's been talking to us a lot lately about our, our position in Christ and the way we should be expressing what God has put into our lives and the power that he's given to the church, the unused power that he's given to the church. And Jesus says in John chapter 15 and verse 4, he says, I am the, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. I was pruning our roses yesterday. Why do I prune the roses? Because, as I was saying to Merle, come spring, the window outside our dining room will be just a sea of colour. 
And what was I cutting off? The mealy bug that was all over it? And the dead stuff? The useless stuff? The stuff that wasn't going to produce a flower come spring? Cutting it all off. Why? That the, the rose itself will be free to do what roses do best. Give us beautiful flowers. Let them go. And all sorts of things can happen to them. They come scraggly and all that. Yes, they'll continue flowering to some extent, but they are better when they're pruned and shaped, aren't they? Much better when they're pruned and shaped. I want to say, Jesus is saying the same thing to you. You and I need pruning and shaping. There's stuff about us that God literally wants to cut off our lives. Why? That what is good can flower and blossom. That we might be fruitful. Oh, there's a lot of debate in the church about what Jesus meant when he said be fruitful. And some of us have this idea that it's like the, 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 the sharpshooters in the Old West, that you know it's a notch on your gun for every person you lead to Christ. That's fruitfulness. Have you got many notches on your gun? Oh, I haven't got too many. Well, you're not very fruitful. What a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. What is fruitfulness? Fruitfulness is a rose being a rose giving good flowers. Fruitfulness is a banana being a banana and giving good fruit, isn't it? I've got a banana and a peach growing side by side. If the peaches came off the banana, I'd be worried, wouldn't you? I don't know that I'd even be game to eat them, although they might taste like bananas. Well, I'd rather eat a banana that is a banana. You know what I mean? How do we know, if we even don't know what kind of fruit tree we've got, plant it and nourish it, and when it flowers and fruits, you'll know what it is. Fruitfulness in Christ is abiding in him that the goodness that flows out of him will flow through us and express him to the world. I often like to ask the question, if the, if the body of Christ was really expressing the spiritual gifts that are within us, what would it look like? What would it look like if we were all functioning in the gifts that God has implanted into our lives, if what is in us was flowering, as it were, what would it look like? The answer is Jesus. Jesus. The world would be seeing Jesus. And do you know what I reckon? In 2017 in Australia, in, in June, the world in Australia desperately needs to see Jesus because they're seeing enough of the enemy. It's time they saw Jesus. And it's up to you and I to let him be seen. And that comes from abiding in the vine, living close to him, allowing him where necessary to prune us and shape us, that what comes forth is those beautiful blossoms. I don't know whether you've got a hibiscus around, but they're in flower at the moment, as they so often are. The hibiscus just outside one of our windows, Merle called me over this morning. She said, have you noticed those? And here were the, th I mean, and I'm not exaggerating, flowers like that, perfect, beautiful, beautiful. What does a hibiscus do best? Flower. What does somebody who is in Christ do best? Reveal Christ. Now, Jesus says to us, the way we reveal Christ is by living in him, abiding in him, being close to him, being nourished by him. Uh, we believe in the importance of the word and the preaching of the word. Paul says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perished, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We believe in the preaching of the word. We believe in the teaching of the word. But the outcome is not praise for the teacher. The outcome ought to be the revelation of Christ in you and in me as we sit and learn, as we read. The outcome ought to be praise and glory to Christ. I am the vine, Jesus said. You are the branches. It's interesting that scholars tell us that, that uh, when the temple was still standing in Jesus' day, that as he left the upper room and made his way towards that garden that we know as Gethsemane, he would have, with his disciples, passed the greatest gate of the temple, the so-called golden gate, that had on it the embossing of a vine. Because the vine was a symbol of, of the nation of Israel. And as they walked past this gate, it seems Jesus paused for a moment and 
turned to his disciples and said, See the vine, boys? I'm the true vine. I'm the true vine. It's not the nation of Israel that's the vine. I'm the vine. Israel are the branches. You are the branches. It's also interesting that uh, the historians tell us that that gate was bricked up by, by the Muslims around the time of the Crusaders and every attempt to unbrick it has been defeated because they're scared of it. Why? Because it was understood by the Jews that through that gate the Shekinah glory of God entered. <laughs> the enemy wants to brick up the entrance to the Shekinah glory of God. Jesus says, abide in me and let my glory flow. Let my glory flow. Let my glory flow. Now that's one picture of abiding in Christ. In the, in the evening class, we have been looking, we, we, we're looking at Romans for quite some time. Go with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Interesting passage of scripture. Paul in Romans 9, 10 and 11 is, he, he almost takes a, a, a sidetrack from his main teaching to try and explain um, the problem he was grappling with that why his own countrymen, the Jewish people, had so rejected the Christ. And he argues this through in chapters eight and in chapters nine and ten and, and, and into eleven. And into eleven he starts to paint a picture, and the parable this time is not a parable of a vine, but of an olive tree. Of an olive tree. He talks about the Jews stumbling. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Interesting comment. We only have the opportunity being provided for us in a sense because the Jews rejected Christ. However, from the beginning, it was God's intention that the whole world would be saved in Christ. Not just the Jews, but the whole world would be saved. The Jews were charged with the challenge of revealing to the world the blessedness of serving God. And they failed at the challenge and Paul says because they stumbled a door of opportunity has been opened up to you to reveal to the world the glory and the joy and the blessedness of serving me he says now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles how much more their fullness and he goes on to argue this through and then he comes down to verse 16 for if the first fruit is holy the lump is also holy and if the root is holy so are the branches and then he launches into this picture and if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree do not boast against the branches but if you do boast remember that you do not support the root the root supports you. You will then say, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. What he's saying, he's saying exactly what Jesus said in John 15. I'm the vine, you are the branches. In this case, I'm the olive tree, you are the branches. And in point of fact, you are a, a, a remnants of a wild olive tree that I have allowed to be grafted into the root stock of the olive tree and to become partakers. His interesting phrase, the root and the fatness. The life of the olive tree flows through us. But then he says, if I need to prune you, I'll prune you. If you need to be cut off, I'll cut you off. Even though you've been grafted in, I'll cut you off if need be. Because I'm determined that this olive tree, which is a representation of being in Christ, I am determined that this olive tree will be healthy and fruitful and flourishing and flowering and giving fruit. What kind of fruit do olives give? The olives. Don't look for grapes on olive trees. Grapes grow on olive, uh, grape vines. Olives grow on olive trees. You see, the nature of the vine, the nature of the tree will determine the fruit. If the tree is healthy and the rootstock is healthy, that's Christ. So the issue is not the problem with the rootstock. If there's a problem, it's with the grafted in branches or the branches, the natural branches needing to be pruned, isn't it? That's where the issue lies. That's where the issue lies. He says that we were grafted in and became partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. And then he says, you don't support the root, I support you. Sometimes we think that God's lucky to have us. 
Oh, God, you're so lucky that I said yes when you asked. Sorry, folks, it's the other way around. We're lucky that God bothered to ask, aren't we? I was thinking of that old children's song. I, though so unworthy, still am a child of his care. For his wide, wide as the ocean, high as the heavens above, deep, deep as the deeper sea is my Saviour's love. I, though so unworthy, still am a child of his care. For his word teaches me that his love reaches me everywhere. In my unworthiness, Paul says in Romans, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Gave us the privilege of being in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. And what's the point of being in Christ? To reveal Christ to the world. That the world might see Christ. Why is the world not seeing Christ in his power and his glory? I think there's a bit more pruning yet to happen. I know he's working me over. I wish he'd pick on somebody else at times. But he's working me over. And I, I would like to say this, and I say it with great respect, if he's not working you over, I'd be suggesting that it's time you got a bit closer and let him. Because we all need it. We all need the work of the vine dresser. We all need the work of the gardener who bothers enough about the roses to go prune them. We all need the, 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 the person looking after the olive trees to make sure that the branches are healthy, that the fruit is good. Now, there's two pictures of being in Christ. The vine and the branches, the olive tree and its branches, Ephesians, which we are now into in the evening class, has another picture of this oneness in Christ. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 14. But now in Christ Jesus... You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Paul's picture is a bit more intimate, isn't it? It's a picture of a man. And in that one man, two warring factions have been brought together into one to make one. And the point of bringing together the warring factors, factions is that the one might be one body strong and healthy. Now Paul goes on to explain in the book of Ephesians similar to what Paul was explaining in the book of Romans about the enmity existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. And in Ephesians Paul is particularly addressing the Gentiles and trying to get them to understand they can come down from their lofty place too because they're fortunate that God has reached out to them. The Jews can come down from their lofty place or oh, we're the chosen people, aren't we special? And accept the fact that unless the two become one, there is not one body. Unless the two become one, they are not both in Christ. Unless the two become one, there is not one new man. In the prayer meeting we were praying this morning, as Neil often prays, we were praying for the church on the Sunshine Coast. There's only one church, many fellowships, We've got a sign that goes up on the board. I might be putting paid to this by saying this, but it says, welcome to our church. Sorry, it's not our church. It's his church. It's his church. Welcome to our fellowship. Welcome to his church. One church, one people, one people, made one by Christ, bringing us together in him. We are one in Christ. I've been cheeky enough on some occasions to say to people, have a look around the room and see who's here that you prefer wasn't. <laughs> Do I need to say that again? 
Have a look around the room and see who's here that you prefer wasn't here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, God's made us one in Christ. Get on. Get sorted. Get sorted. You've got a sore toe, work on it. <laughs> really? Really? Paul says, the eye cannot say to the ear, I have no need of you. Paul says we're one. One body. One body. One body in Christ Jesus. Yes, and you need me. Sorry about that. <laughs> but I need you too. I can't play drums to help myself. <laughs> I suspect at times people look at you and say, has he not quite got the rhythm? But if, they, if I was up there, they wouldn't be looking anywhere else. You see, we need each other. We need each other. And where's any music team without a good drummer? Me. Hey. But we need guitar players and we need singers and we need trombonists even, Gordon, wherever you are. God bless the trombonist. Where are, oh, there he is there. Oh, God's own instrument, the trombone, that I know. I can play a mean trombone and I mean a mean one. <laughs> I can also play the big tuba. <laughs> we'll play with it anyway. But we have all different gifts, you see. Very different gifts. I, I sit there at times listening to Neil when he's really caught up in the spirit and sharing the word. And I say, oh, I wish that was me. I could, wish I could preach like that. And I can't, so you've got to get the way it is. <laughs> but that's the difference. We need each other. And I was there when Neil was writing those notes. I couldn't read them either. So I was glad Nance didn't pass them to me. and <laughs> asked me to read them. Paul talks about the fact that we are one in Christ, one new man. Let's move on to verse 5 of chapter 3 of Ephesians. Chapter 3 of Ephesians and verse 5. Paul talks about the grace that was given to him. He says, in which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. You and I are partakers of the same promise. The promise that you rely on that you will meet with Jesus face to face in the air and live forever with him. I cling to that promise too. We cling to the same promise. Paul says that the same promise has been given to all who are in Christ. The hope that we have in Christ is the hope that we all have in Christ. We have the same promise and we have the same spirit. And you know, if we are one in Christ, you will discern, as I have discerned over the years, that if we are one in Christ, the Holy Spirit in me is not going to disagree with the Holy Spirit in you. Otherwise, if there is disagreement, somebody's speaking out of the wrong spirit. But it's the truth. If there is dispute in the church... If two people are disputing with each other, they're not one in the spirit and one or other has a diverse spirit, if not both of them. There are diversities of gifts, Paul says, but one spirit. There are diversities of functions, but one body. We are one in Christ. And what the world desperately needs to see is us being one in Christ. He needs to us being one in Christ, yes, with the fellowship that is here before we arrive, being one in Christ with them and with any other group. There's a fellowship I think meets here in the afternoon sometimes, uh, one in Christ with them. And when we're down at the hub, the Baptists are on the next corner. Oh, isn't it a good thing at least there's a service station between? No, we're one in Christ. We're one in Christ. You know? they might have funny ideas, but we're still one in Christ. And they think we've got funny ideas. That's all right. We're one in Christ. Back in the 1980s, it seems so long ago, some people in the room weren't even twinkles in their mother's eyes in the 1980s. 
But way back in 1987, Merle and I had the privilege of leading what was called the Lewis Palau Mission to Auckland. And in a period of 10 days, we saw 300,000 people come to meetings. And 6,000 people make commitments or renew commitments to Christ. It was a marvellous time. A marvellous time. And as you drove down any main road in Auckland, you'd see a notice board and they looked exactly the same as if the same person had made them and they had. Same size sign. And the media started to get agitated by the fact that all the churches had these signs on. You'd see a Catholic church, an Anglican church, a Baptist church, a Presbyterian church, a Salvation Army, a Calathumpian and whatever. Even some Pentecostals had the signs up. And the media would ring up and say, I need to talk to somebody about what's going on. What's the business with these signs? You people disagree about so much. Sorry, you've got that wrong. We actually agree about a lot more than we disagree about. But one thing we do agree about, and this is what we're standing on in this crusade, is that there is salvation in no other. There's one way to heaven through Christ Jesus. We stand on it. We stand on it. We are one in Christ. We are one in Christ. Paul is saying what the world desperately needs is to see that oneness because they need to see Jesus. Jesus didn't say that if you be lifted up, people will come to you. He said, if I be lifted up, I, Christ Jesus, he says, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. They need to see Jesus being lifted up. Have a look at chapter 4 and verse 4. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. And then as if he hasn't said that we are, there is one, he goes on to say it. And look at all these references to one. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all. Oh, Chris, there's some people who baptise in funny ways, you know. No, sorry, it's not about the method, it's about what we're baptised into. We're baptised into Christ. One faith, one baptism, one Lord. One Lord. What Paul is also spelling out there is the oneness that there is in the Godhead. One Lord, one Spirit, one Father. The oneness we have in Christ. Well, I might be giving you a little insight into some of the stuff that we've been doing in the Bible classes, but more importantly than that, what I'm trying to share this morning, and you appreciate the fact that I only had a few minutes to pull something together this morning. And I chose God helping me not to go for the pile of gold and oldies, eh? But I believe what God really wants us to hear, because we're certainly hearing it in our classes at the moment, because there's been a real sense of the presence of God as we've touched some of these scriptures. God is desperate for his church to be one. I have to say, global connections is not going to word in the world for Jesus. Oh, it's a great church, I love it. Merle and I feel as though God gave us the greatest gift of all when he introduced us to this fellowship. We were looking for a church. We were church shopping. Yes, we were. We just closed the fellowship that we'd been pastors of because God said, the time is up, you're not getting anywhere. And we had to agree. We weren't, we weren't accomplishing anything. We were just a holy huddle. And we started looking. Somebody said, in fact, I met Gordon and Margaret in the shopping centre a few weeks before. and We got chatting. We'd known each other in a previous fellowship. Where do you guys go? Oh, we go to, to the church that Neil Myers runs. Who's Neil Myers? <laughs> when I turned up, he said, who's Chris Pack? <laughs> Neither of us knew anything about anything or anybody. But that wasn't the point. We just came and felt at home. But being at home in the fellowship is not what it's all about, as important as that is. It's being one in Christ. It's being one in Christ. It's abiding in the vine. 
It's being grafted into the olive tree. It's being in the one body. Why? That what comes out from our abiding is a reflection of Christ, a revelation to the world of Christ. You see, if the gift of evangelist is on your life, then go out and win souls for Christ. But don't claim them as notches on your gun and point out to somebody else that you've got 27 notches and they've got none. That's not the issue. Because your gift might be very different. You might have the gift of hospitality. And the gift of hospitality is the most remarkable gift to make people at home. And if I tell you that most evangelists don't have friends, they need somebody who's got the gift of hospitality, who, who has friends, to bring the two together. And then that the evangelists get to work on the friends of the one with the gift of hospitality. Works that way. Because we are so different. We are so different, you see. But the outcome is the same for all of us. Your gifting being fully expressed, my gifting being fully expressed, Cyril's gifting being fully expressed, Colin's gifting being fully expressed, David's. When the merge together, the outcome ought to be some visible representation of Christ to the world. That the people can see Christ being lifted up and then he's free to draw people to himself. The start of chapter 4 of Ephesians has what is a key phrase in this whole letter. It's a remarkable phrase. If there was one word that characterises the book of Ephesians, it would be the word walk. Walk in love, walk in unity, walk in peace, walk, 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 walk in different ways. But there is no more important statement that Paul makes when he says in Ephesians 4.1, I beseech you to walk worthy. Walk worthy of the calling by which you were called. The issue of abiding in Christ is that we are worthy. We can't earn the blessing of God. We can't do enough to, to, to earn the blessing of God. We, we are not involved in a works righteousness. Paul makes it very clear. We are not works. Ephesians tells us we are saved by grace through faith, not of works lest any man should boast. It's not a works right, right, righteousness that we embrace. We embrace, embrace Christ and he lives his life through us. He blossoms through us. He fruits through us to reveal himself to the world. But the bottom line for you and for me is to do everything we possibly can that we might walk worthy. We can't earn the grace of God, but we can make it our decision, our determination. I'm going to honour Christ in every way I possibly can so that at least there is something about my walk in Christ that somehow shows him that I am a grateful man. You might say I'm a bit soppy and lovey-dovey and all that, but I don't know how many times in a week I tell my wife how grateful I am that God gave her to me. Because God gave her to me. God gave her to me. I've got no doubt about that. The time I first met Merle, another girl had a ring on her finger that I'd given her. And God in his mercy shut that one down and opened this one up. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful beyond words. God gave her to me. I didn't deserve her. God gave her to me. I wasn't worthy. But he said, Pack, I can see the prospect. Let her work on your life for a while, you'll be good. <laughs> 47 years on, she's doing all right. Still a bit to do, she says, but this doing all right. But that's our walk in Christ, isn't it? Walking worthy, responding to what 
we need to respond to, doing what we know we've got to do, allowing him where necessary to prune us that we might blossom and fruit and, and flourish, that we might abide in him, that we might be one in him, that we might be one body in Christ. How God brought us together, I don't know. But he has, and I believe he's got a purpose and a point. And he wants us to be one. Because I don't believe in recycled Christians, I believe in renewed ones. Renewed ones. Renewed ones. If Caleb at 80 can go into, 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 across the Jordan and say, give me this mountain, this mountain where the, the giants lived, where the children of Israel, the last place anybody wanted to be allocated was the area that Caleb said, give me this mountain. And Caleb said to Joshua, give me this mountain. When we came here 40 years ago, I saw that mountain and thought, I want to set my mansion up on a hill on that mountain. And Joshua most probably said to him, Caleb, you poor old fella, do you don't realise the kind of people that live up there? It's mine by right. I claimed it as my inheritance. Give it to me. God is saying to every one of us, if you're under 50, you're so young it's disgraceful. <laughs> don't you laugh at me, Jordan. But whatever age you are, God wants to use you. He doesn't believe in retirement. I can't find the word in the book. But I can find him talking about people being renewed, having our youth renewed, having our strength renewed. I can find that in the book. And I want to tell you, there's a generation out there whether you're baby boomers or the one after or the one after or the one after, your generation needs Jesus and he needs you for your generation. But it can only work if we are one body in Christ and revealing him to the world. Father, we come in Jesus' name and we pray that you will teach us. No more than teach us, energise us to be one body. We know the theory, we've got it in the book. We don't want the theory of it, we want the reality of it. We want you to do in our lives whatever you've got to do in our lives to make us one, that we might somehow reveal you to the world because the fruit that comes from our life is fruit that feeds, that the, the flowers that, that blossom are flowers that attract. Oh God, that out of the life of this body, connected to the vine, connected to the rootstock of the olive tree, one man in Christ Jesus, whatever picture we use, that the oneness draws people to yourself, Lord. That's our prayer. That's our prayer today. And we say to you, as a congregation of your people today, do in us whatever you've got to do in us to make it a reality. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together, please.